Soundstripe. This podcast is for educational purposes only. We are qualified clinicians who will cover various topics on mental health and will sometimes provide community resources. We are not being paid by any organization for our content and any information we provide is general and pertains to our own personal experiences. We do not, I repeat, we do not provide psychotherapy, diagnoses, or treatment recommendations on air. Any concerns related to your individual mental health should be directed to your medical and mental health professionals. We are not responsible for others' decisions or the subsequent consequences. Hey y'all, so we are here today to discuss grief. We wanna talk about the types of grief, the different ways we grieve, different types of losses. Um, And we also have a very special guest here that will be speaking to you about a recent loss that she experienced and her grief process up to this point. Um, I would like to introduce you to one of my very good friends, Chanel Harvey. Um, Recently, Chanel has lost her spouse and she volunteered um, to talk with us this episode about the process that she's been going through. To start out, we just want you to tell us your story. All right. Well, thank you again for having me. Um, I, again, am Chanel Harvey, and I recently lost my husband. Um, It was very unexpected. He was only 36 years old, and uh, I, if someone would have told me five years ago that I would be in this position, I never would have believed them. That evening, um, we had a great conversation. You know, we said said our I love yous and good night, and uh, that was the last time that we communicated. Um, the next day, I had texted him, and he hadn't responded, but I also knew that Sometimes if he knows that I'm busy, he doesn't um, reach out as much. He just sort of waits and I'll reach out when I I have time um, to speak to him. So as the day went on, I started to feel a little weird that he hadn't at least responded to my text message or anything. And I went on um, to a show that we had planned to go to and um, went to dinner. And I sort of was starting to panic that I hadn't heard from him yet. But at the same time, it was like, I felt like God told me that he was gone, but I was in denial about it. Um, So when I got back to my hotel room, I continued trying to reach him. Um, I was texting, I was calling, couldn't get through. So I started reaching out to some of his friends that I knew that he talked to on a um, pretty much on a daily basis. And they said that they hadn't heard from him since the day before. And I thought that was really odd. So they started trying to reach him. They couldn't reach him. The police went and did a wellness check. They said they saw both of our vehicles and they it looked like there were lights on. So um, to be transparent, my husband, Willie, he did have, he, he battled with like depression and anxiety. So there were times um, throughout our marriage and relationship that if he was going through one of those episodes, sometimes he might shut down. But I just thought it was, odd that he would shut down for that amount of time, especially with me being um, so far away from home. So um, that night, you know, like I said, the police went by and then his sister, she also went and what she thought she saw, she thought she saw a different light on than what the police had reported to me. So um, she actually did attempt to get in the house, but she couldn't. So um, the next day it was a a repeat. I ended up um, telling my parents what was going on and my dad went by and he said that the both the cars were there and everything and I'm like okay he must really be in a funk so at this point you know I'm going through a lot of different emotions like worried to angry like why aren't you responding to me and then um, he was a musician so I was like I'm just gonna relax I'm going to you know continue with what I'm doing here and um not panic because everybody's telling me don't panic everything's going to be okay I was like Sunday he's going to show up at church and I'm just going to see him on the live and then I'm just I'm gonna fight him when I see him you know so Sunday morning comes I get my things ready to head to the airport and I still can't get in touch with him so I watch um the live stream and for whatever reason the camera angle didn't show where he would be at and um I was texting everyone that I could see that was there and no one was responding. So once praise and worship was over, I called one of um, the guys on the praise team because I knew that he would be leaving service right after. 
And I said, I asked him if Willie was there. And he was like, no, we thought he was with you. And I just immediately started crying and hung up. I just knew he had to be gone for him not to show up because that was, if he didn't do anything else, he was going to show up to play for all of his gigs. I reached out to his sister and then my dad and his sister and her husband reached the house first and her husband kicked the door in and they found him in our bed um, and he was gone. Um, I was in the airport when I got the call that they had found him. Um, it was, it was like my whole world crashed down in a matter of seconds. Um, I think that um, God had strategically um, ordered all of our steps leading up to me going out of town at that time. The day before I left, my mom randomly sent us a text that evening and said, I'll keep Solomon if you want or need me to. Um, and the whole time the plan was for Solomon to stay home with Lily. I'm just very grateful that my mom offered that because I can't imagine my son being stuck with his dad for two days, you know, trying to wake his daddy up and not, not knowing, you know, how to contact anybody or get out of the house. Um, that night after I dropped, after we dropped Solomon off, I, on the way there, I was telling Willie that I felt really, um, weird about the trip. I couldn't explain it. I felt like something was off. And honestly, I felt like something was going to happen to me and I wasn't going to come home. I just had this really bad feeling in my stomach. I really tried to play everything cool the whole weekend, even though inside, like I'm panicking. Um, you know, I'm at an amusement park trying to reach my husband and still trying to like have a good time with the people that I'm with. Um, but I, I think God knew who I needed to be with when it happened. Um, those two ladies, Stephanie and Stacy, they were absolutely amazing. Um, from the time that I got the call that he was gone, they, they moved hell and high water to get me on a flight, um, to get home to Solomon sooner. Um, and they immediately jumped in and, um, they've supported me throughout, you know, since this happened, you know, checking in on me, um, helping my family, like send meals or whatever. Um, so that's, that's pretty much in a nutshell what happened. Um, it was very unexpected, still, you know, waiting for a final, um, I guess, cause of death. Um, you know, they have given me an idea of what happened, but there's no, Nothing has been confirmed, but it's just, it's just very shocking. He was only 36 years old. He was doing all that he could at like this last year to be healthy. Um, you know, he talked about wanting to make sure that he was here for a long time to see Solomon grow up. So it's very, you know, tragic to think that now he's not going to be here to witness that. All right. So grief we want to kind of first open it up by just discussing the different types of grief as therapists we all have had some form of grief um education while in school or or wherever um, i've done some extensive grief training because i ended up working with a lot of clients going through the grief process um <clears throat> so when it comes to the different types of grief we do have three main types um you have complicated grief which is a type of grief in which the symptoms are persistent, lasting up to, to a year or longer, and it's very intense, and it makes it hard for those who suffer to function normally. So this is the type of grief where the person is just not getting past it because you never really get over a loss, but you learn how to continue to live. But this significantly impacts daily functioning. So that's complicated grief. And then you also have maladaptive grief, which is a type of grief in which you are consumed by the loss and you attempt to cope in harmful ways. So um, you lose someone, you're going through the initial grief process, and then you start drinking or maybe doing drugs or doing other maladaptive coping mechanisms to kind of handle that grief and to kind of escape it. Um, and then finally, we have broken heart syndrome, which is a type of grief in which the stress caused by grief takes a physical toll. 
Um, so if you know someone who says like they physically just feel like they are in pain or they physically feel like their chest is hurting, um, they call that broken heart syndrome. Um, we also have acute grief and then there is integrated grief. Integrated grief is the tail end where you're still grieving, but you are living. You're, you're, you found healthy coping mechanisms and you are moving forward through the grief. What is the grief called when you like don't even have a reaction to it? Like there's just nothing. Is there a type of grief that classifies as? Um, if you don't have a reaction at all, like no emotional reaction whatsoever to a loss or has the loss occurred and now you're in this numb state. No, it's the initial. So I'll I'll share a little context too. Because my brother and I were both kind of similar in this. And we've always felt like something was wrong with us. <clears throat> so when we've lost people in the past, especially specifically if it's like older people in our families and like they're having medical issues and we know it's coming, they pass and everyone's just distraught and just sad. And we're just both like, you know, like there's really no emotional response to it. I had to I had to look through my notes real quick. Yes, it's called absent grief. There are people who deal with grief and it's called absent grief where there's no reaction, no emotional response at all. So that is an actual type. Um, I didn't even I didn't even know that there was a such thing. Like I didn't I didn't know what to label it. I didn't know that it was called act um absent grief, but I think that people don't understand that a lot of different reactions are normal and that we should normalize different reactions because when somebody dies or somebody has some grief, everybody expects a reaction. They expect you to react some kind of way. And I think those expectations are too big for the person that has to grieve. Yeah, I definitely agree. They're, they're in, in a lot of your grief training, you literally get taught nothing is abnormal when it comes to grief. Now, could things be maladaptive? Yes, the way you cope could be maladaptive, but that's still normal because it happens so much. So many people do grieve in that way that, it, that it's its own type. So nothing is outside of the realm of normal when it comes to grief, whether you are the type of person that grieves and you are breaking down and you can't pull yourself together, you can't emotionally regulate, that is very normal. Or if you're the type of person who you just don't show it, it doesn't, you don't express it, you you internalize it or you don't feel it the same way that other people do. It's still very much normal because it's so unique. Grief is very unique to each person. And I, I mean, I would think it's unique to each situation. Um, like, di like the same person can react differently in different situations where they've lost someone or some, something important to them. Um, but for me, it's just always been that reaction. And for so long, I've just felt like, what is wrong with me? Like, am I missing something? Am I mean? Like, am I just, like, I have no empathy. I have no, like, what is it? And I don't know if that's like, maybe like a protective thing, maybe like yeah. protecting yourself from the loss or if it's just a, a deficit in an emotional reaction. So typically- Go ahead. So, Go ahead. I was just gonna say that's why I always have a hard time with like I couldn't do grief therapy because I don't have the empathy when it comes to yes. death and dying. Um, but it, it's hard for me to talk about it too because I feel like something's like, wrong with me because I don't I don't have those emotions. Yeah. Typically, so what you talked about, Amber, and I want to piggyback off of you and Ashley, as well as Shug about the different effects of grief that we go through that people go through typically so when it when you talk about well you know how, how is it wrong that i don't have empathy or you know have certain types of you know emotions or reactions uh, we have what we call like the social effect and you know sometimes that can be called ambiguous grief which means that what is really classified as a real loss or what's an allowable state of grief so we tend to think that when you're in such a state, you have to react a certain way when that's just not, that's not true for everybody. So maybe for you in your 
in your stage, you don't have to act or you don't act this way, but in someone else's stage of grief, they do. So you have the social effects and then you have the biological effects of grief, which pretty much goes into like the body, like the immune system is very much affected. You're, you're activating your stress hormones. Um, and just the neurochemistry and structure in the brain just typically changes. And then you have the psychological effects, which is the irritation, the sadness, the ruminating, like thinking over and over and over again about this situation. And, you know, you just can't seem to get yourself out of it or away from it. And I think one other thing that we tend to forget about is major losses. When we have the major loss, there's a secondary loss that goes along with this major loss. So say you lose somebody, um, you typically could probably lose something else along the way. So I think that, you know, what you guys are hitting on is like different areas that affect you. I know you talked to Ashley about it hurting, like it physically hurts. Well, yeah, biologically, your body is changing. Your cardiovascular system is changing when you are going through the state of grief, especially if the grief is like a really hard grief or complicated grief. So, yeah. And, you know, I was going to actually ask you, Amber, um, and you, you don't you don't have to answer, but it also depends on um, who you've lost. Um, a lot of times, a lot of times, especially like with family members, we just assume that, you know, you lose a family member, you feel some form of grief or some form of sadness. But that depends on the relationship and the connection. So if you've never lost somebody that was a super close connection to you. You may not have experienced grief because you, you just don't feel it. You can't help it if you didn't have a connection with somebody and everybody else may have. So have you ever lost someone that you do consider somebody really close to you and you didn't feel any of the what you would get, what you would think would be normal reactions? I've I've lost quite a few people that were close to me. Only one of them brought out the crying, which is like what I guess people expect. Um, but the other really nothing okay and, I, so, and also i think it that speaks to also like the way that you lose people too so like i said earlier if it's an older person like a grandparent or a great grandparent who has been sick who has had lots of medical issues and then they pass i have i've never really seen the point like i don't i don't see how people get like sad about that or upset about it like when you expected it to come and i, I don't want to sound this is why I don't talk about it. So yeah, it just. But you're not wrong. You're not wrong. Mm -hmm. That so that's also a type of grief. These are like smaller, not smaller, but they're less talked about. So anticipatory grief is a thing. When somebody's much older and you know they are close to the end of life, or maybe somebody has had cancer for a long time or something of that nature, there's anticipatory grief where you already anticipate that this person is gonna go. Like you know it's coming. You you you're you mentally actually prepare for it. Um, and then it doesn't sound strange because I've even said I've had, um, like my, my husband's great grandmother or his grandmother passed, but she was like 90 something. And I'm like, she lived a really full life. It's harder, to, not harder, but the grief is different. It's like, yes, you'll miss the present, but she lived a really full life. So sometimes that's easier for people to accept. Yeah, it doesn't it doesn't sound callous or anything like that. Um, I think you kind of worried about so sounding callous, but it's um, it's logical. Like you know that that person was sick. Like weren't you expecting it? Um, so I I don't think that it does sound callous. I think that it sounds it's 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 probably a part of grief that you've dealt with too. Like I know for me, when my grandmother passed, it didn't matter for me how long she was sick, how old she was, like. I wasn't ready to lose her at that moment. Like, so I like fast forwarded into all the things I'm never going to have all the, um, you know, the almost memories. And so I think that that's where some people might be coming from. Um, because you know, all logic goes out the window too. When, when you, your frontal lobe is clouded with all that grief. I agree. I should, um, when my mother's mother passed, my grandmother, I was pregnant with my oldest daughter and on top of all the pregnancy hormones, it was a lot. And the only thing I kept saying was, this is so not fair that she won't get to see my daughter. Like, that's not fair because I was really close to my grandmother. So it, it just, it's all in how people look at it. Like some people I can look at like, yeah, you lived a full life, but I wasn't ready to lose my grandmother. Just like I should said. 
Yeah. Um, I wanted to mention that like, uh, just another, another part of grief or another part of loss is like, like the loss of pregnancy. And so I, I will share like a personal story here is that I've had, um, two stillbirths and I've worked through it and I've talked to counselors and I had a, like an extremely hard time losing two babies. And I know that the one thing that was said to me every time was, oh, um, you know, they weren't for you or they weren't ready or, um, oh, I mean, people have miscarriages all the time. Just, kind of, you know, you'll, you'll be fine. And that was totally like not the thing to say. And it was hard because some people don't know that a stillbirth means that your baby was viable, that your baby could live outside of the womb if, if it needed to, or that you've made it far enough in pregnancy. Like we see people who have had pregnancies and they've had their baby at seven months. And my daughter was born at almost eight months. And so it was real hard for me just knowing that like, okay, this child, this was a child. Like it didn't come out like, a you know, tissue. It came out a baby. They came out babies. And so just to hear like, it's going to be fine. You know, people have miscarriages all the time. You'll get pregnant again. You'll get pregnant again. When my problem was never getting pregnant, it was always carrying the child to term. And so with that grief, that was, I had the grief like I lost a child and not like I had a miscarriage. And I think that a lot of people don't know the difference and people didn't understand why I was grieving the way that I was. And you know what that, that's, oh, go, oh I thought somebody else thought that. That's so bothersome for me because even there is a, a difference between a miscarriage and a stillbirth. There's a difference, a huge difference. But even for women who experience miscarriage, like you don't get to dictate to somebody how they have attached to this life that they have created. Because if they wanted this child, they have already started dreaming about this child. They have already started having an idea of what the room will look like and her, her his or her name and what we're going to do. And like you, that's taken away. So regardless, if somebody says, oh, it's okay, you can have more, like, no, this having more doesn't replace the one that that's not here. And I don't think people get that. Even if you can have tons of babies, you never forget that one. I think that's where that social component or that social piece come in from in that ambiguous grief where people just have their own definition of what they think grief is and what they how they think others should grieve versus it's ambiguous. You just don't know. Any you can have a grief episode with any loss, like your your typical losses, which is like a pet possibly dying, you know, just something that's typical versus things that are off, you know, not not really typical losses, like a job or you know, or just just something different that would be considered a loss. It could still be a loss. Um, or even maturational losses. With, you know, we see our kids, you know, as of, of course, as if you birth the stillborn, you want to see them go through the other developmental milestones. And when that is not given to you or when that is taken away from you, that is a loss. You're yeah. not going to be able to see that child walk. You're not going to be able to see that child take their, you know, say their first word. And so, again, when we talk about, you know, these these losses, I think people there's such a big social component around it and what we think a loss is and how we think we should act that I think it gets in the way of, you know, allowing people to grieve the way they want to grieve. Yeah. And you know what I did? I had a lot, I had shame around it. Like I felt shame because then, you know, I felt like, why is, why is my body not good enough to carry a baby full term? What am I doing wrong? Um, what did I eat? What did I drink? Um, you know, what, is there something wrong with my genetics? Like you, it started, things started to happen where I, I just had a lot of questions. And, if, you know, of course, I questioned God and everything like, well, why can somebody smoke, drink, do anything they want to do during pregnancy and have a seemingly healthy baby? But me, I'm trying to do everything right. I'm not eating sushi. I'm not drinking alcohol. I've renounced everything. You know what I mean? Just so I can bring somebody healthy through my body. Why is that not happening for me? And then, you know, some people don't even want to be pregnant and then they, they bring this baby into the world or people mistreat their baby and they can still have them. And so I was grieving for myself 
and not jealous of anybody else because I knew what you know what God has for me was gonna be for me. But I was also like, dang, I want that too. Like I I, I can't wait for it to happen for me. And so I was trying to be so trying to be happy for other people in during your grieving process. You know, you got to go to a baby shower, and then people would say things like, "Oh, I don't know what I would do if I didn't have a perfect baby." Like you know, they said you know, kind of off strange things like that. And it, it was very, very difficult. And so like when I see women that have miscarriages or even stillbirths, like I I always reach out to them. I've reached out to people that you'd be like, why would she reach out to her? But I just, my heart goes out to them. You know, I wanted to touch on something you said, Auntie Shug, because it's an element that we, that a lot of people don't think about when it comes to grief. But the shame and the self-blame, we tend to find that a lot with mothers who have miscarriages or stillbirths. And we also find it a lot with suicide. If someone you love commits suicide, you you fall into blaming yourself or kind of shame. And then also when people are murdered, a lot of times with parents who lose children to like violence, somebody's murdered, it's like, what did I do wrong? Like, what did did I, should I have lived in a better area? Should I have taught them something different? Like, how did I raise my child in such a way that they would even end up in a predicament where they would be murdered? And so that shame is something that a lot of people don't realize comes along with grief sometimes. Um, so I just I just briefly also wanted to, to talk about uh, another thing I'm seeing a lot of now, a separation anxiety post-COVID, which is, you know, where... It can happen in adults too, but mostly it's kids and teenagers are becoming like just really anxious when they have to separate from a major attachment figure. Um, And one of the things that's kind of contributed to that is, you know, when, when parents were getting sick, were getting COVID and they were really close to dying. I mean, like on the brink of it. So now you have kids who are extremely scared anytime their parents get sick. I, I guess that also speaks to PTSD, what you what we were talking about earlier. But anytime their parents get sick or, you know, don't feel well, look tired, whatever the case may be, then um, it, it's kind of like a fear of loss and like that anticipatory grief that Auntie Ashley mentioned earlier. It's like, okay, if my mom is sick, like, I'm really scared that I'm going to lose her, but I need to prepare now that if something happens, I would be able to deal with it if I lose her. Um, and, and and that's tough for, for younger kids to do. Now, I just wanted to add to that, Auntie Amber, that separation anxiety, especially with COVID. Like, that, that's the place where I saw it a lot. There was a lot of fear that if if I leave this person or they go out of my sight, I may never see them again. Like, I, like I legit might not see them again because so many people are dying just rapidly and it's not we're not getting time and then also a lot of people struggled when people did have to go into the hospital and because of all the regulations that had to go into that you couldn't go sit with your loved one you couldn't go in there and sit next to them and support them or 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 in those moments with them like we normally would have so it's like i'm separated and ripped apart from this person the second they go into the hospital so that's a fear. Like, I don't want anybody to go to the hospital because I might not be able to go up there and even visit them. I, I, I'm scared for that to happen. People was having babies by themselves. That's like, crazy. they was having babies, like, and they could only have one partner in the room, but then, like, or, and then some people, they, you know, they just wasn't, they wasn't letting them up. And I can't yeah. imagine. Yeah. Labor is a bear. To be in there by myself talking about some COVID, <laughs> like, you, you know, and that's the only time you're going to have that baby. That's the only, you never, ever get those moments back and just grieving the way that it happened yep. and what you didn't get to experience. That happened to my cousins. That happened to my cousins. They found out their father died in the hospital by himself. We had to find out. And to this day, like, it's a moment, like, I always think about for them. Like, I could not imagine. They literally lost, we lost my aunt, their mom, uh, like, four years ago. So they just found out that their dad, you know, died two years ago in the hospital by himself and nobody could go up there. They didn't even know. That is wild. I, I, I legit don't even know what I would have done if I couldn't have been there at the hospital when my grandmother passed. It, or if I had to give late, like if my mother, because some, like you said, some people, some hospitals allow one person to be there for the labor, but only one person. Like, 
I would have flipped if it couldn't have been my mother and my husband. Like that would have bothered me. <laughs> you know, I'd be like, no, my mama needs to be here now. Now, come on now. But it's, it's I'm not choosing. That's wow. All right, so there are two models for stages of grief. Most of us have learned or used the five stage of grief model where there are five stages, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. But I like to use the seven um, stage model. So that is shock and, shock and or denial, pain and guilt, anger and bargaining, then depression, the upward turn, reconstruction and working through and acceptance and hope. So I like that seven because it gets you to the upward end of grief, how we process through it and get to the other side. And just to clarify for the stages too, it doesn't mean that you go through them in order, right? They can happen in any specific fashion at any point during your grieving process. Yes, and you can go back and forth between stages as well. I guess Chanel had quite a bit to say about some of the things that are not helpful to say or do for someone that's grieving. So check out this quick clip. I've had people come up to me and say, well, you're young, you're beautiful. Um, you'll, you'll have love again. And it's like, thanks. But at the same time, like, I didn't plan on being on the market <laughs> again, you know? There are some people that, uh, it's almost like they, they want to have a pity party about it. And it's like, he wasn't even close to you like that. And so when you see me and you try to like cling to me and almost like get me to be in an emotional space at that moment, like that's not helpful. Like I wasn't crying. I wasn't upset. So don't come and like try to grab me and almost like force this emotional response then there's the people that should have had a relationship with him and uh he tried to make things right um they didn't they weren't open to it and now that he's gone they're trying to replace him with me i can't replace lily you know what you're trying to pour into me and to Solomon. Willie's the one that needed it. I think it's also important to, you know, with Chanel mentioning things that aren't helpful is the ambiguous grief. I will always continue to say that because not every grief, not everybody's grief is the same and not everybody's going to react the same. And just because someone is engaging in behaviors that you do not feel like is morally or, uh, you know, right or whatever your definition of grief is does not mean that that person can't um, you know, grieve the way they need to. Um, so it's, it's just important to know that different cultures have different levels of different variations of grief and different religions. Like, like people practice all different types of things. So it's important to just be mindful and open when other people are expressing their grief in ways yeah. that you may not see fit for yourself. I teach, that's actually a really good segue into um, something that I use with all clients in my grief work. Um, and it's called the Mourner's Bill of Rights. So there's two things I, I share with them. I tell them your grief is not meant to get smaller. You're meant to grow around it. So people like expect grief to like get smaller over time and go away. No, your grief remains what it is. The, the love you have for someone who you lost remains and you kind of grow around it and you live. Um, but the Mourner's Bill of Rights is specifically for um, letting people who are grieving know you have the right to grieve the way you grieve. No one has a right to tell you how to grieve. Um, and it's written by, it was created by Dr. Alan Wolfelt, Wolf, Wolfelt, I think that's how you say his last name, Dr. Alan Wolfelt. And I'll just quickly tell y'all what, there's 10 of them. There's 10 rights that everybody has who's grieving. Um, so you have the right to experience your own unique grief. No one else can tell you how or how long. Um, you have the right to talk about your grief. Talking can be healing. And you also have the right to not talk about it. Sometimes people will tell you, well, don't isolate. I want you to open up. If you're not there yet, you're not there yet. And that's fine. 
Um, you have the right to feel a multitude of emotions. So anything from confusion, disorientation, fear, guilt, all those things, you have a right to feel those and we can process them later, but you have a right to feel them. Um, you have the right to be tolerant of your physical and emotional limits. So you have a right to kind of say no to things, to, to say you're not up to doing this or doing that. You, you have that right. You have the right to experience grief burst, which are kind of like sometimes out of nowhere, you get a powerful surge. Like Chanel talked about, like getting the milk that day. She just broke. You have a right to that at any moment. Um, you have the right to make use of ritual. So more than just how we traditionally think about funeral rituals, but anything like if you wake up in the morning and your ritual is, I'm going to say good morning to this person, even though they're not here anymore. That's fine. You can do those things. Um, you have the right to embrace your spirituality. If faith is a part of your life, if it's not, that's, that's okay too. Like Auntie Shug said, or I mean, like Auntie Keish said, you have the right to search for meaning and you have the right to treasure your memories and you have the right to move forward towards your grief and healing. I really like those bill of rights. I had never heard them before, um, before today. So I really did learn a lot about that. And I did want to point out too, that Auntie Keish said something about everybody not being spiritual. Um, I would say meet people where they are. When our guest earlier talked, she talked a lot about her faith, a lot about God. And so one thing that I did tell her was, I hope he gives you beauty for ashes. And as a clinician, I never introduce religion. I always let people introduce it. If they do, I can speak to that. I'm multifaceted. But I, um, whenever they do start, I grab onto something that they can hold on. Because a lot of people, if they have faith, that faith takes them far. And just playing on what's good for them. Meeting them where they are. Not imposing my beliefs on them. Or, you know, trying try not to say the wrong thing. But letting it be, let, letting it be client led is what you would call it in therapy but the griever led like let them lead you where they want to go when my grandmother died I just sat with my mother and that was hard I just sat with her like I didn't start any arguments <laughs> I didn't um if she needed me to go get something I did it if she was hungry what you want me to go get what do you want me to do just sometimes just being present and being there is enough that's a good, that's a good point. Phil. I like the client led, like le letting the person lead you to how they want to grieve instead of you trying to hold their hand and leading them on your own. Um, I also want to make this really quick that um, I know that, you know, ambiguous grief can look different for everybody. Um, however, if there is any sort of wanting to take their lives, um, any type of suicide or intent to harm, um, you should be contacting either the local authorities or someone who is able to is equipped to handle that situation. That's a very good point because a lot of times grief goes hand in hand with depression. Mm -hmm. And so we did talk about grieving for as long as you need to, but being in a depressive state sometimes comes with it. So just checking in on the person who is grieving, um, watching out for the signs, like we talked about the suicide episode um, last week, just watching out for the signs and just kind of honing into what you think that they may be experiencing or even asking them, you know, just, you know, what are you experiencing? How can I help you? What do you need from me? You will get people who say they don't want to be here anymore, but that's when that may be that extra further questioning, like Auntie Shug had suggested, you know, asking, asking the question just to verify. Yeah, I'm glad you clarified that too, because that that speaks to you know the types of grief. Complicated grief is different. That is somebody where it's over a year and they still haven't processed any further in the grief process through the stages. So you have to look into that when it's like that because now it's impacting daily functioning. Um, yeah, and I was gonna piggyback off of something that she said um, when she was talking about depression, the depressive state too, because even while you're grieving, you may have some of those moments where like, um, like Chanel said in her interview, you know, where you're having like a decent day and you're not necessarily really sad. You're not necessarily really happy, but it's just, it's going. Um, but then there may be some moments, specific times of the year that trigger a depressive state. And so having your support system understand how they can support you 
or you asking how you can support that person during these times of the year, holidays, birthdays, um, could be helpful as well. And our girl Chanel also spoke on that. So check out this clip. I have, I've thought about uh, my birthday. I've thought about the holidays. I wanted to honor the stuff that Willie had already expressed that he wanted to do. Um, so as I think about the holidays, uh, I'm, I'm nervous about it, but I just want to like, in a sense, like pull on Willie, like what are things that you told me that you wanted to do um, for or with Solomon so that I can make sure that I incorporate that or honor that. I think one of my biggest things is that I don't want people to like try to coddle me if that makes sense like if you haven't made a big deal about it in the past like I don't want people trying to like make a big deal about it just because he's not here so I don't know I think I'll take it one day at a time like I I've definitely tried to be intentional about letting myself grieve so if it hits me and I break down I break down um if I'm good, I'm good. And I try to just embrace that. You know, I try to uh, be intentional about smiling. Um, yeah, it's trying to get back to Chanel and making sure that I'm good. But, you know, so that way I can be good for Solomon. As a step parent, remembering, so this is if you're coming in a little bit later on, you know, the kids 10, 11, maybe even 14, 15, just remembering that for a long time, it's been that child and their primary parent and you're coming into their environment. Sometimes it's the, it's the other parent. The yeah. other parent plays a big role in whether the kid has good adaptive functioning in the step-parent role. Because I think people get mixed up in thinking that they're trying to scratch their own itch or they're trying to make themselves feel better and they don't realize that everything you do should be in the best interest of the child. I be telling these parents to get over themselves because you got your own stuff that you dealing with. You want to be with this man or this woman so bad that you're going to keep your child from them until y'all get along knowing good and dang on well Y'all ain't gonna get along no time soon. But, now I agree with that. It's some it's some bitter baby mothers and baby fathers out there, just bitter. But we can't ignore the fact there that sometimes that other parent is sending very mixed signals. I have literally heard men say, I will always have access to my baby mama. I've, I've never been married to someone as a step parent, but I've been a girlfriend to men who had children. I, I will not. <laughs> step in to say anything to this parent but i will i will be a sounding board and support system for the person i'm dating unless i'm directly being affected by the child or by the other parent i'll play my position which is shutting the fuck up period now that <laughs> I'm I'm not about to fool with you today. <laughs> what what happened to the parent, the biological parent that's like, yo, y y all y'all bills is paid. I ain't gotta do nothing. I don't gotta buy school clothes. I don't gotta buy school supplies. I don't gotta buy. I don't gotta buy nothing. All I gotta do is show you, up. They yeah, respect here. that. You better respect that person in that house. You respect that man. That's that's, that's all. <laughs> <I would be. laughs>